On 31st of May 1967, the Architectural Association of Kenya was formed. What does it mean for AK turning 50? It's terrific. <laughs> oh, I feel very happy that I've been there at the beginning and I'm still there, very much active. We are 50 today. I hope and pray that when we're celebrating 100, I will be still able to see the light of day. I'm glad there's a golden jubilee, I'll be part of it. I saw the silver one, and uh, there we are. Our theme captured, captures it quite aptly, um, looking back, moving forward. Uh, birthdays are a wonderful time, anniversaries are a wonderful time to look back and see what have you achieved. They say the past shapes the present and defines the future. We look at the history of the built and natural environment. When I started in 67, I had just joined the university. And uh, so a student, we are being kicked left, right and centre by, by those who are in the profession, of course. And I no need to talk about the colour. At the stroke of midnight on the 12th of December 1963, amid jubilation, the new Kenyan flag was hosted for the first time at Uhuru Stadium, Langata. The will of the people had triumphed. At the time, Kenya was gaining its independence. The country had to overcome the racial segregation debacle. The various professions in the association were no exception. I'm very proud of the association and I reflect on the fact that when I came to Kenya, the only black African architect was David Batiso. He asked me, but by the way, who will you be designing for? After all, Africans live in mud huts. I don't think I'd answered or whatever I answered. Uh, I couldn't be rude to Amzungu. At the new Stanley Hotel on May 31st, 1967, experts in the built and natural environment met with the principal agenda to form a new society. The association was established in 1967, primarily by four professions, as the architects, engineers, conservators and planners. They got together to start a local organization because before then it were they belong every member belonged to a foreign body. The engineers belong to the I think the Institute of Engineers of UK, the Corn Surveyors, the Royal Chartered Institute of Surveyors, uh, the architect is RIBA and the planners of course of the Royal the, the, the Royal Planning Profession. So they got together so that they can manage their built environment professionals locally. I think I started about, about 50 years back uh, and uh, fortunately I think I'm, I'm one of the oldest members. My, my number is 22, Mem membership number. I think before that all, all those people before me, I think they have died. Fortunately I'm still alive. <laughs> oh, uh, that was um, mainly accidental. But a very happy accident back in uh, 1968, actually, that I was invited to come and teach at the university. And I arrived on the 9th of January, 1969. And uh, that was uh, a, an important step in my career. I was a young practicing architect in London, but I was somehow um, interested in exploring more dimensions of, of the profession. I've always been active, uh, although very much I was, became involved in research and environment and development issues, but I always kept my membership of the association to lobby for uh, changes like more orientation to uh, low income housing, the conditions of slum dwellers in our cities, and environmental innovations like green building. And I'm very happy to see that those changes have come about, but I can remember uh, working with AAK and even uh, 
uh, International Union of Architects back in the 80s on uh, innovations needed on climate change and green building. I arrived in 1969, six years after independence. Um, the tallest building in Nairobi was Barclays Bank Queensway, about seven storeys high. And so um, there was scope for development. I've been here about 47 years. <laughs> so um, I joined after it had been formed. And I joined um, for one very material reason and another because I'm interested in architecture. But I joined because I would then meet my clients. You know, I was sitting among architects. Um, but because I was then on, I, uh, I, I went through the treasure. I was the treasurer once, and, I even, and then I became the chairman. Initially, a lot of the architects were foreign. Okay, We had very few indigenous architects at the time of independence. I think the first indigenous, indigenous architectural firm is Oweru and Associates, and that was formed in 1972. That is how many years? Seven years. I mean, that's what, about nine years after independence. Well, we're on Associates um, is an architectural firm uh, founded in January 1972. Uh, we've been in continuous operation for 45 years now. Uh, the founding partner is James Gathesha Waweru, um, a graduate of the University of Nairobi, 1970. He was the first indigenous Kenyan to set up an architectural firm in Kenya, wholly owned by himself. Um, since then, of course, it's grown and uh, it's gone through um, various transitions and uh, I now find myself um, in partnership uh, with my father, James Redeshoero is my father. As the country grew through the period of industrialization and economic development, there was a surge in rural to urban migration. Kenyans from different parts of the country were relocating to the city and its environs. The ever growing population needed suitable housing infrastructure. In one sense, that the hallmark to me was the early town planning of Buruburu, which was Matisse Menezes. And for me, uh, I was in Uganda in those years, and of course, Buruburu was being developed. Uh, by the Commonwealth Development Corporation here and they were very, very happy with what David Matiso and Brad Menezes were doing in terms of the town planning of the place. Buruburu is a project that um, was assigned to uh, Matiso Menezes. Uh, the developers were Commonwealth Development Corporation but uh, long-term money, but uh, the same organization had funded uh, housing finance of Kenya, so purchasers could uh, purchasers then paid back uh, a long-term money. Now, uh, initially, we started by. Um, uh, a social study by Leone Menezes, the wife of uh, Menezes. He did a, she did, she was a planner as well. Um, she did a, a social studies for the area to establish peace of people who are middle income, the people who are earning about 5,000 shillings or below. Therefore, they can afford a quarter of their income to pay the mortgage. And uh, we, we did it, and then we prepared the master plan for, for the whole area, 6,000 units, but to be developing phases. Uh, each phase about 1,000 units. The period between the 60s to the 80s was and is still considered as the golden age of architecture. This was evident through the transformation of the Nairobi skyline. 
Before that, a lot of uh, the architecture that was being put up was government funded, but post-independence now companies are coming to the fore and, and, and uh, engaging architects and you can see a new language. We call it the golden age in Kenya of architecture, beautiful forms, um, a lot of influence also from different countries, not the traditional col colonial master Britain, but a lot of Scandinavian architects come in in the 70s. Um, and you can see that in KICC by Carl Nostvik and uh, together with David Mutiso. The time when we studied, at least I studied, um, uh, the modern architecture, uh, the Cabourgier, people like Le Corbusier, people like uh, uh, Lloyd, were all sort of what all students sort of aspire to. Uh, but within uh, Africa, those are at least as soon as we started practicing, we tried to look, to look at the symbols or what we could include in our buildings that will identify with the African um, uh, the climate, etc and um, their culture. Um, there, have been, there have been quite a number of successful ones. They all come out of their cultures, and part of their culture is uh, building materials come out of the ground. And that's one of the first things we taught when we reoriented the architecture uh, education, was look in, into your local environment, what are the materials that are used for building now, and how can those be adapted and used in building a new building industry based on Kenya's uh, resources of, of a building industry, but also the social meanings attached to architecture and why people build the way they do. I decided that I can make a change by getting into the leadership of the Architectural Association of Kenya. So 2001, I became the registrar of the Architects Chapter, 2003, the secretary, 2005, the vice chairman of the Architects Chapter, 2007, I was honored and privileged to be the vice chairman of the association, and then come 2009, I became the, the chairman. I'm actually the longest serving chairman because I served from the year 2009 till 2013. But what is significant is that in 2010, uh, the year 2009 I was arrested, 10 years later is when we got a letter from the PS then, Kirui, uh, at local government who said we should not pay for the single business permit. So I always say if you have a cause, push it and eventually it will bear fruit. There's a kind of downstream impact which is clearly traffic. Um, and quite interestingly that, that people claim that the city centre is overbuilt in offices and there is therefore a shortage of residential accommodation and uh, the most recent building which I've been involved in uh, is um, by the Railway Golf Club and uh, there will be a lot of residential accommodation so that people can walk to work. So three things that I think have been uh, of great pride to me. I will start with the uh, commencement or the implementation of the electronic uh, construction permit management system. AK participated via um, a design service we provided to Brand Kenya, the London 2012 Olympics. Um, we were represented at Kenya House. Um, we provided uh, the designs for the whole uh, of Kenya House um, during that Olympics. And the last one I'll discuss, of course, was the acquisition of um, a new home for AK Secretariat. We are 50 years old, but for the majority of that 50, we were renters. Um, and our most recent home, of course, was Professional Center. The association has been able to offer bursaries to numerous aspiring students in the built and natural environment. I applied for, for the funds 
which was actually advertised uh, in, in the AK media. And upon receiving the invitation to be part of the first beneficiaries, I took it as a, as a very positive idea that was brought to the institutions. And now from this is when I started appreciating what the kitty has done to, to, to students. The built and natural environment profession over the years has had challenges in diversification. But in 2017, a cultural change emerged as the association elected the first female president. As a first female president of AAK, it's first of all uh, quite uh, heartwarming in a way that um, people really have embraced me. It was I was uh, I rose to the top through uh, grassroots, and even at those times, I've always felt a lot of support, and I've never felt like an outsider because I'm female. If anything, there was some novelty to it, and people were like, "It's time, please take it up." So nothing but. Uh, um, love in that sense and support from all practitioners and I think everybody agrees the timing was right, it was about time. Technology has been on the frontier of the industry's evolution. As the years pass by, so has the technology used. It's been interesting how technology has changed over the years. From the time when I was a student at the University of Nairobi, we used to fight with set squares, T-squares, butter paper, these days, everything has gone high-tech. Um, we're talking about um, use of softwares like Archicad, Atlantis, and uh, the ability, of course, to be able to showcase to our clients has really become diverse. A major change was the introduction of the computer. The, the consequence of that was that offices became smaller. Um, before the computer, there were many draftsmen, and after the computer, there were fewer. Probably around the late 90s and early 2000s is the new, in terms of um, computer-aided design came to the fore. It had always been there, but that's when really Kenyan practitioners started to embrace it. And we slowly moved away from hand sketches and making models uh, very as an active design tool. And now we've gone into technology um, and using 3D models on computers. Materials are changing all the time. Uh, trying to improve the, the functionality of the built environment. A lot of research going on, not, not in Kenya, it goes on in UK, Europe, America, and these days, of course, in China. So in the time, new materials are being introduced, they are tested there, and some of us are quite quick to assimilate them even before they are properly proven. It's, in a sense, I think, for the future legacy of Kenya, I think it's sad because I think us architects are not getting the time to look at what we've done, reflect on it, learn from it, and then do it better next time round. I have great love for the parliament building, okay. Uh, KICC, that one will always be close to my heart. Bombers of Kenya, uh, great building. We have the Australian High Commission building. I think it was actually done by planning system services, if I'm not wrong, uh, done from wood. I would say that is, uh, Top notch. Then um, the University of Nairobi. It'd be very interesting. We have the fountain of knowledge. It's not a building, it's a monument, but it's the statement of uh, what I would say defines what the University of Nairobi is. It's very difficult to say because Vantley Jorgensen, who's an old Danish architect here, um, has listed what he thinks are the best buildings in. Nairobi, and I would defer to him. I do put the Kenyatta Conference Centre high. Um, are there others of my era? Um, not quite sure. After the settlement between the Mau Mau war veterans and the British government, and the British government made a settlement for uh, the victims of torture, 
who had brought the case, and included in that settlement was also uh, a small amount of money for a memorial. That memorial has now been built in Uhuru Park at Freedom Corner, and it was opened in August 2015, and I am very proud of it as a piece of public open space design. It's a podium, very simple, and the budget was very low, uh, but showing the story of uh, the emergency, the Mau Mau struggle, and then the settlement between the British and the, and the war veterans. The association hopes to achieve its vision set 50 years ago of being the leading professional organization in the natural and built environment. It's been, there have been very many challenges. I think one is perception, perception or that professionals are expensive. I don't need professionals on my project because um, they are expensive and um, and they are only for a certain class of people. Um, if I'm building, you know, in Huruma, I I do not engage professionals. If I'm building in a certain areas of the city, I don't need them. Uh, but we cannot. Uh, uh, underestimate the value of professionals on a project. They save you money, um, and that's part of the job of AK to educate members of the public on that. So definitely that has been a challenge. Um, other challenges include being able to charge uh, for our services and being paid for our services. The bit that is difficult in all countries is how to provide housing for the poor. Now, by and large, the AK sometimes has good, well it has good intention, but uh, uh, sometimes makes attempts, but it isn't actually effective. It has been an incredible journey of challenges and achievements. The future looks promising and brighter than ever. I would say that, you know, keep it up and uh, be proud of the work you do and, uh, and, and sure enjoy yourselves. And there are olders like me and other people to ha help them to make decisions. One thing I hope the future leadership of this country will do is to make sure that they listen to us Oise, who've been around a while, and although we look a bit doddery and possibly talk too much, I don't know, we do still have quite a few sensible things to say. Yeah, keep, keep going on these um, innovative aspects, which is the green building where Kenya has made great strides and, and um, we, they need to work with the authorities to bring in bylaws that uh, influence green building. That's happening actually, it's, it's uh, on the cards. And, and also um, get off this uh, sort of neoliberal economic approach to building housing uh, for making money moving forward from drawing from our experiences, where are we going? So for AK, it's a milestone, uh, um, one that we are very happy to mark, uh, but also one that we do not take lightly, and we will uh, certainly be charting the way forward and ensuring that we're still relevant for the next 50, 100, 200 years. <laughs>